final status agreement we can get, how can we get uh, the two sides to come together and sign a final agreement when we should be asking what kind of Israeli-Palestinian agreement we can actually get given the difficult conditions on the ground and the numerous constraints. I think there's a way forward, but we have to be realistic and practical about what can be achieved. Rather than push the sides to focus on a final status agreement at this juncture, Israelis and Palestinians should instead pursue a long-term ceasefire or truce, which includes Hamas. Strategically, we're still trying to get to the same place. We're still trying to get the sides to a final status agreement, which will lead to uh, a two-state solution. But the constraints to reaching that kind of an agreement at the moment are too great. Most important, perhaps, as we've been discussing, has been the rise of Hamas and its ability to thwart the negotiations through numerous rocket attacks. Those attacks can be treated by Israeli military incursions and military operations, but they cannot be eliminated using military means alone. The reality, as we've heard on the, uh, on the panel already, is that no viable Israeli-Palestinian political agreement can be reached without the cooperation of Hamas. Continuing to marginalize and boycott Hamas will only lead to more violence and stalemate. But at the same time, there is no guarantee that bringing Hamas into a political framework will actually solve the difficult issues dividing Israelis and Palestinians. But it has a much better t uh, chance of succeeding uh, than the final status agreement. Hamas is not about to renounce violence or recognize Israel and its inclusion in the political process will likely make a final agreement even more difficult to reach. A majority of Israelis are equally skeptical that the current formula of negotiations will actually lead to a comprehensive agreement which has a chance of implementation. A truce has a much better chance of stabilizing the crisis by decreasing the ongoing violence. Over time, it could strengthen the development of Palestinian institutions, including a non-politicized security force, and could normalize Palestinian-Israeli interactions. It could even lead to Israeli military withdrawals to the pre-October 2000 lines and even beyond. The goal would be to create an interim accommodation and environment where serious negotiations could proceed without daily violence. It allows progress without forcing the two sides to compromise on existential and final status issues which they're incapable of compromising on. Now this is admittedly a difficult approach, and it's fraught with danger, but I think given the many constraints that I've outlined, uh, it's probably the best option for moving forward. So what are the basic terms of this truth? They've been debated in the press quite a bit over the last few months. The ingredient should include a ceasefire, meaning a halt to all Palestinian rocket and other military attacks against Israel, uh, a halt to all Israeli military incursions in the Palestinian territories, a prisoner exchange, and lifting the siege of Gaza. It also requires a minimum of Palestinian unity, which is something that we haven't discussed yet today. Without an internal Palestinian accommodation between Hamas and Fatah, there can be no viable Israeli-Palestinian agreement of any kind. So what does a truce not include? A truce does not require any direct US or Israeli engagement or negotiation with Hamas at this time. It certainly doesn't preclude direct contacts, but what is more important at this stage is a credible mediator or, intermedi or intermediary uh, to, uh, to work out the terms. It also doesn't mean abandoning President Abbas and the so-called moderates. President Abbas should remain the key Palestinian interlocutor, but he should not be prevented from working with Hamas and other factions to reach consensus on the many issues dividing Palestinians today. Most importantly, the U.S. should not block the resumption of a Palestinian unity government if that is what Palestinians conclude is in their national interest. Now, ironically, a resumption of a Palestinian unity government or some kind of Palestinian internal Palestinian accommodation will likely terminate the negotiating process underway between President Abbas and Prime Minister Olmert. That's not necessarily a negative development, in my opinion. I think it's better to have no negotiations, the ne negotiation process that only leads to more frustrating, frustration, anger, and violence. Obviously, that is precisely the opposite of the current U.S. strategy launched at Annapolis. That strategy is based on further dividing Palestinians, 
and has elevated the negotiations to a sacred status with the aim of reaching a framework agreement by the end of 2008. Such an agreement, if it is signed by President Abbas and Prime Minister Omar, will be so watered down that it will be virtually void of any meaning. What, what the U.S. has failed to recognize is what Israelis and Palestinians need most today is not a shelf agreement, but an end to daily violence and terror. That can only be achieved through a broader political strategy which addresses Hamas's control of Gaza and its permanent role within Palestinian politics and society. Now, while the debate is heating up here in Washington, it's been ongoing and intense in Israel for quite some time, at least for the last few years. What is interesting, I think, is that a gap has really emerged between Israeli public opinion and the position of the government and the military. Even uh, cabinet ministers on, on the right, such as uh, Shah's party leader, Eli Shai, several weeks ago made a statement to the press calling for the government to engage in direct negotiations with Hamas over the release of Eli Shali. That's, that's a significant shift uh, for someone like Eli Shai. As Ambassador Freeman mentioned, uh, Haaretz newspaper poll in February stated that 64% of Israelis supported negotiations with Hamas over a ceasefire and a prisoner exchange. When that was broken down, over 50% of Likud voters also supported uh, negotiations with Hamas over a ceasefire and uh, prisoner exchange, which I think is a staggering, uh, staggering number. Israelis want an interlocutor that can deliver. They want an interlocutor that can implement an agreement that is reached, and they certainly don't believe that President Abbas uh, is that, is that uh, interlocutor, and he certainly doesn't have the ability to implement any agreement. I think this also demonstrates the Israeli, the Israeli public's willingness uh, to look at Hamas from a different perspective, to recognize that Hamas has a role uh, in some future Israeli-Palestinian accommodation, and that without Hamas's participation, no progress can actually be achieved. Now, the government and military are very skeptical. They have a completely different position. They see the conflict with Hamas and other Palestinian militant groups as an ongoing war, and they do not want to lose operational freedom against Palestinian militants. They also fear that a ceasefire will allow militants to retrain and rearm, only to be stronger once hostilities resume. Despite the periodic, sh uh, the, the periodic short lulls in the rocket fire, which have been brokered over the last uh, several years, the military is convinced that a renewed round of intense escalation is only a matter of time. And they look at the example of Hezbollah, which stockpiled weapons and uh, built up its, its infrastructure after the uh, Israeli withdrawal from Lebanon in 2000, and its performance in the 2006 war. And they see that as a very troubling uh, precedent. On the political level, the Prime Minister is wary of legitimizing Hamas and weakening President Abbas. The political echelon interprets any ceasefire arrangement as throwing a lifeline to Hamas at a time when it is seen as struggling in Gaza. And also, there are significant fears of growing Iranian influence in the Palestinian territories. Now, these are all valid concerns, which I think must be addressed. Just because we think Hamas should be included in the political framework, doesn't mean that that framework will necessarily succeed. It's been nearly two years since Gilad Shalit was kidnapped by Hamas and other Palestinian factions, and all efforts to broker a prisoner exchange have failed. Even the periodical lulls that we've seen in the fighting have also broken down prematurely and have had limited success. At the same time, the hardliners in Hamas, especially the military commanders in Gaza, are growing stronger, they're growing louder, uh, and some factions within the military leadership may oppose the troops. The political leadership, including the exile leadership in Damascus, uh, is going to have a difficult time trying to sell the concept of a truce to the military leaders of Gaza. So when we examine Hamas's role, we should have very modest objectives and be realistic about the challenges of including Hamas in a political framework. Rather than waste our efforts on a comprehensive agreement, on a comprehensive agreement which is beyond reach at the moment, we should promote a long-term truce which includes Hamas and which could eventually set the stage for a more meaningful final status agreement in the future.